Draco Malfoy and the Depths of the Mind. By Draco, we'll hear about this. Chapter 14. Advice warranted and unwarranted. Draco was counting down the days to the Easter holidays. Not that they were getting out of the castle, per se, or that with only six weeks left until their owls, they would have any kind of relief in terms of free time. But with the way things had been building up ever since Umbridge had become headmistress, he would take any kind of reprieve they could get. And if that came in the form of two weeks without lessons, so be it. The tension between them all was stifling whenever they saw each other for longer than five minutes, and Draco didn't quite know how to make it go away. Hermione had been outright avoiding Draco, and it had taken him a while to figure out that the reason for that was that she felt guilty for the whole Merietta Edgecombe disaster. Can you really blame her? Weasley glared at him as if it was all Draco's fault to begin with. You've been at a throat about the way she chose the members from the moment the DA was formed, and now the things blew up. You mean now that it turns out I was right? Draco ground out he wouldn't have said that if it had been Hermione talking to him, but something about Weasley attacking him was ticking him off. See? Weasley snapped, pointing at him. And you wonder why she's afraid to face you. Draco sighed deeply, rubbing his face in a tired sort of way. She's not really scared, Harry told him apologetically. She's just really angry with herself. She feels like the whole thing could have been prevented if she had just listened to you. Well, it's too late for that now, Draco grumbled. It happened. Avoiding me won't change that. It wasn't until Draco wrote Hermione an angry message via their charmed parchments that they were finally able to sort the whole thing out. They stayed awake half of the night and wrote page after page, for when Hermione spoke her mind, it was never short. But the next morning, she pulled Draco into a tight hug, and with that, the whole issue was forgotten. Hermione wasn't the only problem, though. Harry had been extremely quiet and sullen for a while now, and Draco couldn't pinpoint what the problem was. First, he had thought it was the whole Umbridge versus Dumbledore disaster. But then he noticed that Harry's occlumency lessons with Snape had come to a sudden halt. He records I can carry on by myself, now I've got the basics. Harry told him, not meeting his eyes. What the heck? Draco asked, stunned. You haven't got any basics, Harry! We both know it! You haven't once managed to deflect in either my advances nor Snape's. And you don't tell me about your dreams regularly, but if they stopped, I'll fly a lamp around the school stalkers! Harry grimaced. Tell me the truth. I told you the truth, Harry said forcefully, but he was still not looking at him. He really was a horrible liar. He probably just wanted to get rid of me, to be honest. Thought I was a lost cause anyway. But that's an outrage, Harry, Hermione got in. Dumbledore gave him an order and he disobeyed. I think you should go back and... No, Harry shook his head, determination in his eyes. Just drop it, Hermione, okay? Draco studied his face, and he knew that whatever had happened, there was no way there'd be any more classes between Snape and Harry. Maybe, though, that wasn't the worst thing. These classes had been a horrible idea in the first place. All right, Draco said finally. The less time you spend with Snape, the more time we can spend on working effectively. Works fine with me? Okay. Harry shrugged, but the idea of more occlumency sessions with Draco did not seem to exactly cheer him up. Harry kept moping all the way to the Easter holidays, and regardless of what Draco tried, no matter if he asked straight out what was wrong, or if he pretended not to notice and stayed at his side in silent support, nothing seemed to comfort Harry. Draco didn't quite know what to do. It was only when, one afternoon, as they were sitting in the library brooding over revision for potions exams and Ginny joined them to hand them both an Easter egg Miss Weasley had sent, that he got to the root of the problem. Harry accepted his egg in the quiet serenity that Draco had gotten used to lately, and Ginny met Draco's eyes, exchanging a look of concern with him. Are you okay, Harry? Ginny asked finally. Yeah, I'm fine. Harry said quietly, though he didn't sound it. You seem really down lately, Ginny persisted, her voice soft. Is it about your fight with Joe? Oh, Draco had not even known there had been a fight. His heart fell. I'm sure if you just talked to her... It's not Cho I want to talk to. Harry cut her off, and Draco frowned at him, intrigued. Then who do you want to talk to? Drago asked, slightly miffed. It's not like he hadn't been practically begging Harry to talk to him for the past week. I... He glanced around to make sure no one was listening. I wish I could talk to Sirius, but I know I can't. 
Trigger just looked at him, his stomach heavy. He should have thought of this before. Sirius was the only thing Harry had in terms of a paternal figure. Of course he would want to talk to him when things got rough. Draco only averted his eyes when Jenny spoke up, drawing him out of his thoughts. Well, Jenny said slowly, if you really want to talk to Sirius, I expect we can think of a way to do it. Jenny, Draco hissed, Umbridge has eyes and ears everywhere, especially now that she formed the Inquisitorial Squad. If she catches Harry, stay up. She frowned. The thing about growing up with Fred and George is that you sort of start thinking anything's possible if you've got enough nerve. Draco stole an apprehensive glimpse at Harry, but Harry was staring at her with something akin to hope in his eyes, and Draco knew that this was going to happen. God damn it! Gryffindors! In the next moment, though, there came a high pitched screech from Madame Pins about books and chocolate, and Draco realized that Harry had, in his absent mindedness, begun eating his chocolate egg. They barely had enough time to grab their notes before they were chased out of the library by their own books, bags, and ink bottles. Shortly before the end of the holiday, their common rooms were equipped with pamphlets and leaflets with the intention of informing them about various career paths, and notices were put up informing them of their career advice sessions with their heads of house during the next week of the summer term. His own appointment was set for Tuesday morning throughout History of Magic. He spent a lot of time discussing the pamphlets with his Gryffindor friends that weekend in between their study sessions. Hermione had copied most of them with a spell and brought them down with her, and honestly, it was a perfect excuse to ignore the schoolwork in front of them for a little while. Well, there aren't fonts of healing, Weasley said, skimming through the thick St. Mungo's pamphlet Draco had perused earlier. It says here you need at least an E at newt level in potions, herbology, transfiguration, charms, and defense against the dog arts. I mean... Blimey! Don't want much, do they? Well, it's a responsible job, isn't it? Hermione said absently. Plus, honestly, that's the core subjects. Draco shrugged. Who doesn't aim for an E in any of those subjects? Weasley glared at him over the edge of the pamphlet. Draco ignored him. He was reading over the ministry brochure for their different trainee programs once more, lingering as he so often did on the unspeakable program. They want arithmancy, though. You could do it, Hermione, Draco. Draco looked up and blinked, not having listened in the slightest. I don't much fancy banking, Hermione muttered. Then what do you want to do? Harry asked them curiously, dropping his pamphlet and peeking at what Draco was reading. Draco fought the urge to pull it out of his sight. The Ministry, Harry said, looking up at him. You want to join the Ministry? No, Draco said, frowning. Yes, I don't know. He said, I don't want to do it under this climate, but I am interested in the job of an unspeakable. Oh, Hermione said, looking up in awe. That is interesting. All the research you'd be doing. Yes, Draco nodded with a note of yearning in his voice. That's exactly why I think it would suit me. Not that my father would approve, of course. Why well, no, Weasley frowned. Is it work at the ministry respectable enough for a Malfoy? Work? Is it respectable for a Malfoy? Draco pointed out, snorting. We're an aristocratic pureblood family. Gentlemen don't work. We invest our money. We do charity, politics, or any activities to increase our social standing. But we do not work. Well, Harry scoffed. It's not like you're planning on following the footsteps of your father, is it? No, Draco said decisively. I definitely am not. So if you want to work, do it. Harry shrugged. And if you want to be an unspeakable, go for it. By the time we graduate, maybe the whole fudge and umbrage issue will have taken care of itself. Maybe, Draco agreed. Still, it might be good to have a plan B, one that doesn't involve the ministry. But the only thing I am interested enough to go after is alchemy, to be honest. You could be a scholar, Hermione suggested, scrambling for one of the pamphlets and pushing it at Draco. It was the one that held an overview of the most renowned wizarding universities of the world. I could be, Draco said doubtfully, but the place to go for alchemy is Paris, and I don't fancy leaving the country. He specifically did it look at Harry. But you speak French, Hermione said encouragingly. Draco just shrugged. So what about you? Draco asked, keen on diverting the attention off himself. Any ideas? Not really, Weasley shrugged. Mom will want me to join the ministry, that's for sure. I want to do something useful. 
Hermione said with a sigh. The what exactly that is, I'm not sure. Ah, Draco smiled. The penalty of choosing a path when all doors are open to you. Oh, shut up! Hermione rolled her eyes. As if your situation is indifferent. At least I have an idea, Draco pointed out. So do I, Hermione frowned. I just... I wish I could work in the direction of SPEW. They all felt quiet. It took Draco a moment before he could speak again. Creature liaison, he suggested, at the ministry, or politics in general, if you're interested in making a difference. Hmm, she said thoughtfully, looking at him. Yeah, maybe. Their silence stretched on, and Draco looked at Harry again. And you? he asked finally. Don't think I haven't seen you drink in that page on the Aura Trainee program. Harry grimaced and shrugged. I don't know, he muttered. It sounds like something I'd know how to do, you know. It's dangerous, too, Draco said softly. You've seen Moody, haven't you? Yeah, well, Harry chuckled. I know for a fact they don't all look like that. Draco sighed. Well, he murmured, if it's what you want to do, go for it. Just maybe think of a plan B as well. The political climate and all. Harry nodded, but didn't say anything. When school started again, it looked like Ginny had finally come through with her promise of appointing the twins to the role of delegating Harry's conversation with Sirius. Draco was late to the gossip, seeing that he was banned from the Gryffindor table for breakfast, and they had to keep their voices and heads down throughout breaks and classes. But while working together in potions, Harry informed him that Fred and George were going to stage some sort of distraction later that day, which would allow him to enter Umbridge's office and use her fireplace to contact his godfather. Draco, being who he was, immediately saw the sheer Gryffindor-esque brand of risky idiocy to this plan, and at the same time he knew very well that there was nothing he could do to change Harry's mind from taking the chance offered to him. Harry wanted to talk to Sirius, and he wouldn't rest until he'd managed it, and all Draco could do now was make sure he didn't get caught. So instead of arguing, Draco bit the poisoned fruit and asked if there was anything he could do to help. And Harry's fond smile was almost worth his effort. Not really, no. Harry told him, a little regretful. It will be suspicious if you hang around the office while I'm in there. And anyway, I'm not even sure when Fred and George will act. But I really appreciate your support. All Hermione has been doing is trying to talk me out of it. Draco wasn't exactly surprised by that information. He stole a look across the classroom to find brown eyes boring, accusing holes into both their heads. It was enough to make him feel guilty, but he, unlike Hermione, knew not to fight lost battles. That did not, though, keep her from lecturing him all throughout ancient runes about the weight his words have with Harry and how he should use the power effectively instead of just giving in to Harry's every mood. Draco had to bite his lip to keep from smiling throughout her never-ending rant because despite the seriousness of the situation, the way she talked reminded him of what little he remembered of whenever his mad grandfather had vented about pure blood privilege and birthrights and not letting them go to waste. But he imagined that voicing these associations would probably raise Hermione's ire even more. All in all, Draco was happy to part with Hermione after ancient runes and make his way down to the greenhouses for herbology. He spent a quiet lesson efficiently clipping his venomous tentacula, and it was almost a therapeutic task. When he came back up to the school, though, he stepped right into hell warmed over. Apparently, Slytherin fifth years had missed quite an ordeal as they had been stuck in the soundproof greenhouse away from the tumult of the castle. Fred and George, true to their word, had set up a distraction for Harry. Namely, they had turned one of the school corridors into a swamp. Which was a tiny bit ingenious. Draco had to give them that. Not so great was, though, that they had been caught. Not that they had given Umbridge the opportunity to expel their mind. Or at least that was the story that everyone was telling in the corridors. Did they really take off on their brooms, shooting fireworks up in the air, scattering flyers for their new shop, and sending peeves after Umbridge? Draco asked Harry later that night via parchment, not only a little mournful for having missed such a legendary spectacle. No flyers, Harry answered, and no fireworks. But the rest is true. Marlin! Draco wrote his quill lingering on the last letter. Yeah. Harry agreed, no words needed to express the sentiment. I'll miss them, Draco admitted. This place will be dull without them. 
I know, Harry wrote, but they've been planning to leave for a while. I just wished it hadn't been for my sake. Well, if it helped you get out of whatever slump you've been in, I can't think of a better cause, to be honest. When Harry didn't answer immediately, he added, Had a good talk with Sirius? Yeah, Harry replied. It really helped. Good. Then I will ask no more. Thanks. You're the best. I know. Brat. Reckless idiot. You love me anyway. You have no idea. Draco whispered to the empty room. Instead of answering, he changed the subject. Shut up and tell me how your career counseling session went. Oh, that, um, it was an adventure. That sounds intriguing. Yeah, Umbridge told me there was no way I could ever become an Auror because the minister would never employ me, and then McGonagall went crazy and said she'd personally make sure I'd succeed. Whoa! So no pressure, huh? Shut it. It was both really cool and sort of scary. I can imagine. McGonagall can be really intimidating. You have no idea. Well, now I'm looking forward to my own session. Tomorrow, right? Yep, second period. Well, good luck with that. Let's see if she can piss off Snape, too. If Snape comes to my passionate defense the way McGonagall did for you, I'm going to skinny dip in that swamp. You never know. Everyone hates Umbridge. Too true. And when it was Draco's turn for career counseling the next day, they did indeed see just how much Snape hated their new headmistress. Snape's expression was already sour when Draco entered the room and Draco couldn't blame him. He'd have the same expression on his face after every minute of sharing a room with that toad of a woman. Mr. Malfoy. He brought out, obviously calling onto his patience. Please take a seat. As you well know, this meeting has the purpose to talk over your career options, which, no need to be coy, we both know you have quite a few. So unless you are going to wax poetry about muggle liaisons. Draco, despite himself, can't a smile. Right. Snape nodded. So, out with it. We don't have all day. You must have some ideas. Well, Draco said, collecting himself. First of all, I have a stark interest in alchemy, which is why I would like to pursue the subject in some way in the future. I see, Snape answered, narrowing his eyes. There are quite a few career paths involving basic alchemic knowledge, but not a lot of them actually focus on the subject as such. I know, Draco agreed. That's why I have been looking into two options in particular. Well, don't kill us with the suspense. The first would quite obviously go into the scholarly direction. The Nicolas Flamel Institut d'Alchemie in Paris is very renowned, as far as I've read, and if I did my doctorate in the field, I could go into teaching. It is a feasible path, and one I could picture you in, Snape acknowledged before continuing. You surely have the grades for it. Being accepted would not be an issue, and many teachers would not hesitate to write you personal references. Not to mention that Hogwarts has direct links to said institute, due to Dumbledore's history with Flamel. He held in, then, his lips curling into a sour expression as he added, Though I must warn you that the teaching profession can be... texting at times. Draco tried hard to keep a straight face. He continued at once before continuing, I'm not quite sure, though, whether I'm ready to leave Britain after my graduation. Then I'm sure you have another option within Britain. I do, Draco said, trying hard not to glance at Umbridge, who had been remarkably quiet until now. And that's the one I prefer, actually, though I don't know how realistic it is in the current political climate. Snape raised an eyebrow. Don't tell me, Mr. Malfoy, his head of house drawled, sounding tired to his bones, that you two want to join the Orbers, because I don't think I'm ready for that particular discussion. Not the Orbers, no, Draco responded, his words slow and careful. Rather, the unspeakables. Snape stared at him long and hard. It looked like he was refraining from banging his head against the desktop. Or maybe Draco's head, come to think of it. Mr. Malfoy, Umbridge spoke up from next to Snape, sounding impatient. I thought I had made myself clear at the beginning of the year. As long as you maintain your relations with Harry Potter, there is no future for you within the ministry. Thank you, headmistress, 
Snape rolled his eyes. Now, if you'd please let me continue counseling my student. Oh, please, she said in faint sweetness. Don't let me stop you. Snape took a deep breath, seeming to call upon all kinds of deities he did not believe in for strength. As I said earlier, Snape began, with your qualifications, I think quite frankly that every door will be open to you, eventually. Severus, Umbridge interrupted. Oh, do be quiet and let me speak, Snape snapped. The current political climate is an issue, but it's up to you to decide how to handle it. All the paths are open to you. You just need to choose to take them. It took a moment for Snape's words to sink in, to read everything he was implying. They did have a double meaning. For Umbridge's side, they could read as him choosing to follow down his father's path and leading a respectable life to turn the tide. From his viewpoint, though, it read quite differently that it was up to him and his friends to position themselves clearly for a future in which Fudge became insensequential. Or maybe to even help make sure that Fudge would become inconsequential. Slowly, Draco nodded, showing that he had understood. If you do wish to pursue this, Snape continued, ignoring Umbridge's expression of utter outrage, you should realize that the unspeakable trainee program is one of the elite programs on the ministry and accepts a minimum of seven newts with at least two outstanding and none under exceeds expectations. Not that I'd expect any less from you, but I'll mention it nonetheless. Very well, Draco acknowledged. And which subjects will be required? The core subjects, I assume. Certainly, Snape agreed. Defense against the dark arts. Potions, Herbology, Transfiguration, and Charms, for a start. And Ancient Runes and Arithmancy. You'll hardly be able to drop any subjects on Newt level. I didn't expect I would, Drago admitted. On the contrary, Professor, I was wondering. In the past, there have been instances when alchemy has been offered as an elective on Newt level, when there has been a demand for it. Do you think that might be the case for our year? Snape sighed deeply at that. Seeing that Professor Dumbledore used to take over these particular courses, I don't think it will be possible this time around, I'm afraid. Oh, Draco nodded, having expected as much, but still feeling disappointed. Do you think I can still specialize in alchemy as a study field if I never took classes on it at school? Seeing that you never were given the chance, I'm sure your future employer would be understanding of your circumstances. Snape ensured him. Plus, there are always seminars you could take up once you are in their employ. Severus! Umbridge cut in, her voice a hiss. Would you please stop giving this boy false hopes? There is no chance that he'll ever have a position at the Ministry, not with the company he keeps. Yes, we heard you the first time. Snape shot back impatiently. I'm just answering his questions. I thought that was what this counseling session was about, Headmistress. To give the students information. Draco bit his lip. Hard. And when he was excused only a couple of minutes later, his face broke out into a grin so hard that some of his school comrades actually turned to stare at him. Snape was, and there was no questioning it, a right git most of the long day, but it could be bloody entertaining if all that brooding sarcasm was directed against someone you actually hated.